Good morning. This is Ivo Dalder of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and uh, thank you for joining Worldview, a weekly review of the world news, uh, where we bring journalists from around the country and around the world to have a discussion on the major issues uh, mm -hmm. that occurred over the past week. This week uh, with us is Steve Chapman, the columnist and editorial writer of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, Steve is joining us from Chicago. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Uh, also with us is Carol Giacomo, editorial board member of the New York Times and currently the Ferris Journalism Professor at Princeton University. She's joining us from Connecticut. Carol, welcome. Thanks, Eva. And Gideon Ruckman, who is the Chief Foreign Affairs Commentator for the Financial Times, is joining us from London. Gideon, great to have you. Hi. Uh, Steve, let's talk, uh, start with you uh, on the question of Israel. Uh, after three elections, and the threat of a fourth election in just a, a week. Uh, just earlier this week, uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the longest serving prime minister in Israel, uh, agreed to form a, a government with his uh, chief rival, uh, Benny Gantz, uh, and have, a, in fact, the government that prevents the fourth election from happening, a government that we've been trying to uh, get together in Israel for quite some time, an important agreement uh, at a time of national crisis as Israel too is facing uh, the COVID-19 outbreak uh, to get a government going. Uh, what, what got us finally uh, over the threshold to get a government going, Steve? Well, I think partly just frustration over the stalemate, which has been going on for nearly a year and a half. Um, I don't think anybody particularly wanted a fourth election, uh, least of all the Israeli people. Um, the the coronavirus you know crisis has also sort of been a a motivation to get a government and this is uh, being billed as an emergency government to deal with the coronavirus crisis and in fact the uh, parliament is not supposed to deal with any legislation that ha doesn't have to do with the coronavirus for the first six months except the trump peace plan so the idea is that the, the two parties the two main parties neither of whom could command a majority, um, are going to join together and deal with this crisis and uh, keep Netanyahu in power. Now, it may, work, it may not work out that way because there's a provision in the agreement that if the Supreme Court rules that an indicted prime minister can't uh, continue in office, then there will be another set of elections. Um, now, Netanyahu is scheduled to go on trial in May, uh, so even under the best of circumstances, if the Supreme Court doesn't rule that way, um, you're gonna have the spectacle of a sitting prime minister uh, going through a criminal trial. And there's, you know, obviously th that can drag out for a long time. Um, I guess the other important thing, I mean, the important thing is for Netanyahu is that it keeps him in power um, for another 18 months. And I don't think anybody who's ever watched Netanyahu uh, and how he handles his political challenges would be surprised if that agreement doesn't work out to the advantage of, of his, his rival and now his uh, partner, Minnie Gantz. Um, Gantz, I mean, in a sense, he's been turned from, from Netanyahu's opponent to his bodyguard because the only way Gantz is ever going to become prime minister, it appears, is to keep Netanyahu in office for the next year and a half until the agreement calls for Gantz to take over. Uh, Carol, I mean, Benny Gantz uh, had run three elections on the idea that the one thing that couldn't happen is to be in a government with a indicted uh, prime minister, uh, in this case, uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, and yet, in the end, uh, he decided that presumably because of the crisis, it was necessary to go into coalition uh, with, uh, with Netanyahu. Uh, what, what's the impact uh, of that on the, uh, on the opposition uh, that was united against him? Well, you know, the opposition in Israel has been very weak and fractured for a long time, uh, which is one of the reasons why Netanyahu, I mean, he's, he's a very skillful politician, Netanyahu. And, um, and Benny Gantz has lost uh, credibility with a lot of people and, and a lot of allies be, just because he decided to go into government with, with Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. You could argue that it, it, it's in the best interests of the country because uh, 
It is a critical time. Uh, the whole, the idea of this democracy uh, flailing about and being unable to even put together a government has been, you know, it's one more example in the world where democracy is making people really wonder how viable that system of government is. So, um, but, but, but Gantz has really taken a hit uh, politically because he did that. Gideon, uh, uh, Steve, Steve mentioned that the one thing uh, in addition to dealing with the coronavirus crisis uh, that the new government can deal with is the, is the Trump peace plan. Uh, and then until uh, July 1st, nothing can happen. But at that point, uh, uh, the government is able, uh, assuming it gets a parliamentary majority, uh, to move forward on, uh, on uh, the most important part of that peace plan, which is uh, the possible annexation of the West Bank uh, to Israel. Uh, how is that part playing in Europe? Very badly. I mean, you know, the Europeans, I think, will be aghast if, if he does that, because uh, essentially it's the end of the two-state solution. Um, it's incredibly provocative to the Arab world and so on. Uh, the question is whether they'll be so distracted by COVID-19 um, and their own problems that they won't really react uh, in any way that will uh, intimidate or inhibit Israel. I think that's quite likely. I mean, I think the Israelis, certainly Netanyahu, will feel this is an opportunity that um, you can do all sorts of things at a time when the world is so focused on this extraordinary health and economic crisis. Another issue, uh, Carol, uh, to, to, uh, to raise is what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, COVID-19, of course, has had a, uh, a, a remarkable global impact uh, uh, but in many countries, we actually don't really know the impact yet because there is no uh, real testing going on. And yet, uh, in, uh, in, in Afghanistan, we see that uh, the government is, uh, is stricken, 40 staff members uh, in mm -hmm. the president's uh, uh, own uh, entourage have already been infected uh, and uh, are now in isolation. Uh, we were a few months ago thinking that the peace process was actually going to move forward. Remember, the United States and the Taliban had agreed uh, to a peace process, and the Taliban was now working with the government to move to the next phase. Um, uh, where are we in, uh, in, in what's happening in Afghanistan, and are we any closer to an end to the war, uh, an end to uh, uh, the, the situation there, and frankly, an end to uh, U.S. and non-U.S. military uh, participation uh, in that effort, which is now the longest war the United States has fought since uh, uh, since the, uh, the the beginning of uh, of time. Well, that's a lot of questions. So, uh, look, Afghanistan's uh, miseries never seem to end, and on top of, as you know, decades of war and instability, now they're grappling with this COVID pandemic. Um, thousands of Afghans who once fled, Af uh, Iran, uh, fled Afghanistan to Iran to try to escape the fighting are now returning to Af or have returned to Afghanistan because the COVID outbreak in uh, Iran is among the worst in the world. And they brought the pandemic with them. From January to April, I think it was, nearly 240,000 Afghans crossed from Iran into Afghanistan, and the virus has been reported in 30 of the 34 provinces. What's clear is that even after billions of dollars of American and international aid and investment, Afghanistan lacks the healthcare infrastructure to, to address this virus. But the pandemic is just one more stress on a system that's already overwhelmed. And some really fear that it could lead to disintegration of the government and possibly the country itself. Um, as you note, the uh, Trump administration signed a landmark agreement with the Taliban in February. And the withdrawal of American troops has actually already begun. Uh, they're going from 12,000 troops to 8,600 in um, and we don't know exactly where they are right now, but they're moving towards that, and then supposedly to zero uh, in a little bit over a year. Yet the deal didn't require a permanent ceasefire. There are two secret annexes which are believed to stipulate the criteria under which the U.S. will decide if the Taliban is actually fulfilling its commitments 
The assumption is the administration is keeping them secret because they give Trump free reign to simply declare the war over and, and, and depart. Meaning, meanwhile, the fighting is uh, continuing and other key elements of the deal are stymied. Um, there were elections in September between President Ashraf Ghani and the chief executive Abdullah Abdullah. Um, Ghani was declared the winner, Abdullah objected, both men were sworn in, both have claimed victory, they've been unable to get, uh, reach some sort of compromise on the leadership structure. The United States has now cut off a billion dollars in aid to Afghanistan, which is completely dependent on American assistance and international systems. And, um, you know, the peace talks, the U.S.-Afghan deal was supposed to lead to peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban, and those haven't even begun. So the situation is, is it's very stalemated. And, um, you know, clearly the United States wants to get out. Clearly nobody is winning there. Uh, but the question is, you know, is this agreement really the, the, a constructive basis on which to achieve that goal. And now there's, there was reports this week that um, the United States is thinking about withdrawing uh, CIA units from direct involvement with the, with the Afghan forces um, back to the embassy in Kabul in order to give, you know, it's, it would be a, a, a you know, a concession to the Taliban. Um, and, you know, there are serious questions about that as well. It seems like, um, you know, the uh, administration is so desperate for a deal that they are giving uh, the Taliban almost anything it wants. Steve, um, uh, we've been here for uh, almost 20 years uh, in Afghanistan since, uh, since October of 2001, immediately after the 9-11 attacks. Um, uh, stalemate, as Carol describes, is probably a good word for the situation for the past decade. Uh, not much really has, uh, in a very fundamental way, uh, changed in, uh, in the situation. The one big change was the negotiation between the United States and the Taliban, which was something that's new, tried, it led to an agreement. Uh, should we just declare victory and go home, as we did, uh, as some argued, we should have done in Vietnam earlier, uh, and just decide the time's come? I'd like to see a real effort to get a peace agreement before we go. Um, I mean, I think we should have left a long time ago, but I think we do have this opportunity. I, but I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that I, I just don't think the president is going to be willing to make the sort of decisions he has to make, which are going to be very painful and are going to be far short of what anybody in the U.S. would like to accomplish in Afghanistan before we're going to be able to get a deal. I mean, you know, the Taliban... <laughs> The Taliban are there. They're not leaving. We have the option of leaving. Um, it's pretty clear to them that if they hold on long enough, they're ultimately going to get us to leave. And therefore, we don't have a lot of negotiating leverage. But in the short run, we could we could we could make a deal that would make it would slightly improve the chances that Afghanistan will be stable and somewhat democratic and somewhat prosperous. I mean, these are all very relative terms um, in, in, you know, in the, in the near term. I, I, you know, it's hard to be very optimistic, but I think the Trump administration has got to be willing to make some hard decisions as part of a peace deal if we're going to leave with some semblance of dignity. Gideon, uh, the United States is not alone there. Uh, in the U.S., the, the argument is always that it's about the U.S. who is there, and that, of course, has the most troops, has been there, uh, and, and has had the most troops. But this has been a NATO operation uh, since uh, 2004. In fact, NATO troops and, and British troops, uh, in particular, have been on the ground since 2001. They were there from the very, very beginning. Uh, uh, and so they uh, remain there in, a, in an advising and training uh, role. Uh, is, 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 is anybody paying any attention uh, in, uh, in the UK or in, uh, in Europe to, to this? And, and what is the European input uh, to uh, how to resolve this issue and this, stand, this stalemate? No, I think the short answer is no. You know, I think if you told British people, uh, it's just not in the headlines. There was a period when a lot of people were being killed and there were um, 
there were British, uh, you know, soldiers being brought back and their coffins and so on were on, on the news, but that's, that stopped. And so the sense is that this is now an American problem. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the issue that Europeans are focused on to the extent that they are really is Syria because that leads directly to flows of refugees, although actually a lot of the refugees showing up in Europe are also Afghans, but they're coming via Iran or via the Syrian route. Um, so, no, I mean, you know, it's easy for the Europeans to, uh, to lecture the Americans for, you know, letting, letting the issues slide, but, but there's been even less appetite in Europe, I think, to, to get involved. Carol, you want to jump yes. in? Yeah, uh, Steve, uh, tell me what decisions you think the Trump administration is not making, because it seems to me that the president is uh, is actually the moving party in all of this, and that he is prepared. I mean, now that the CIA pullback is on the table, um, it seems, and and that there are these two secret annexes, which which people seem to feel, um, uh, you know, basically is a fail safe way for the president to to determine when the Taliban have, have met the criteria for the peace deal and would allow him to just say, okay, we're out of there tomorrow. So what decisions do you think they're not making? It seems to me that the if there's a drag on this, it's the military who have invested so much in Afghanistan over the years. Well I think I mean I think the the president has to make it clear to the military that we're going to have to accept something less than victory, that we're going to have to accept, uh, you know, a, a, not a very good deal, and that we're going to have to get out. We don't know what's in the secret annexes, so we don't know what it is that's sort of uh, complicating the process. But I think if if Trump were willing to make the decisions that would, uh, you know, bring about, you know, the conditions to allow withdrawal, then he would have done it by now. I don't know if he's willing to do it. I don't know if he will. I think I suspect he would probably prefer to just po postpone all this until after November, and then if he's reelected, then he can he'll have an opportunity to get out with very little political risk. Mm -hmm. And if he loses, well, then it's somebody else's problem. Um, I want to remind our, our our viewers and those who are listening uh, online that they can too participate in this uh, conversation. If they go to their uh, you go to your browser, type in ccga.live. You can uh, ask questions there, and uh, and we will uh, take them uh, as we come along uh, in the next uh, ha uh, half hour or so as we continue this conversation. Uh, Gideon, uh, you wrote a column uh, earlier this week uh, on uh, on the strongman virus that uh, together with COVID-19 and the coronavirus that is affecting so much of the world, uh, the political systems, both in democracies and in non-democracies, were affected by the sense that strong men thought that this was their moment. Uh, we also see that in, the, in 2019, we had all these demonstrations in all these places, and as uh, there's a sheltering in place and, and gatherings are, are, are being banned for, for good health reasons, uh, that there is uh, no more social protest in the way there was in Beirut and Hong Kong and Chile and everywhere else. Uh, how does the politics of, the, of this play out at home? Yeah, well, um, I think that potentially it's, it strengthens the, the opportunity for that kind of strongman style of politics for a couple of reasons. I mean, firstly, um, people are scared, understandably, and that then opens the way for people to claim emergency powers. The most striking example of that's come in Hungary, where Viktor Orban, who'd been chipping away at the independence of the judiciary and uh, you know, freedom of the press, has basically got parliament, which was controlled by his party, to give him the power to rule by decree uh, for, uh, for as long as it takes. And Orban, okay, Hungary is not a huge place, but Orban's become an important figure. I think uh, Steve Bannon called him one of the heroes of Europe after he built the wall to keep out refugees. Uh, so he's a kind of emblematic figure, and he's the one that's moved fastest and hardest on all this stuff. But there are other things, as well as the opportunity to claim extraordinary powers, we're also seeing uh, the expansion of surveillance technology, which was something that people were worried about before, but suddenly governments can say, perhaps with reason, you know, we really need to know where you've been, who you've been in touch with, to follow you around on mobile phones, and people are prepared to accept that. Now, 
You know, is that going to be rolled back later? Will we even know if it's been rolled back later? So you're getting a much more intrusive state apparatus uh, accepted. And then the other thing you alluded to, the, uh, the impossibility, really, of, of demonstrating. Um, so we've seen in Hong Kong, again, uh, over the weekend, the Chinese suddenly rounding up some of the leading figures in the uh, pro-democracy movement. Actually, this time, not so much the young people, but the elders, people like Martin Lee, who's mm. you know, nobody's idea of a rabble rouser. He's an 80-year-old QC, but Jimmy Lai, who's an important newspaper owner. Uh, these guys were, were arrested uh, over the weekend. Now, uh, if that had happened pre-COVID, you would have had big demonstrations in Hong Kong, but now it's very hard to, to gather. And you would have had a very big international reaction, but now everyone's got other things on their mind. So you can see uh, the Chinese as well, um, you know, burnishing their ability of, or the image of Xi Jinping, which could have been very badly damaged by this. They've, they've somehow, at least domestically, turned it round into Xi as the father of the nation, saving them. And they're also using it as a way of, of cracking down. Um, but it has to be said, I mean, not all the strong men have reacted uh, with kind of certainty or adeptness to this. So, because I think one of the reactions by this kind of populist ruler, which, as you point out, span both democracies and countries that we're used to thinking of as authoritarian, but quite a few of them have been inclined initially to dismiss the whole thing. Uh, I don't know whether it's uh, seen as weak to to take a you know a medical threat seriously, but you had Bolsonaro in Brazil being the most striking example, saying you know we should uh, we should stand up to this like men, not like kids. Uh, sacking his health minister for being too insistent on social distancing. Um, and even in, you know, in the UK, I mean, the, the Boris Johnson supporters would resist the idea that he's a kind of strong man figure, but his initial reaction was a bit casual to, to, to this. And indeed he ended up getting seriously ill himself. So um, I think not, not all of the strong men have taken advantage of it, but you can, I'm certainly a bit worried that, that uh, this, pre-existing trend towards this kind of populist, nationalist, very personalized style of politics um, is going to be strengthened by, by COVID-19. Carol, uh, uh, Gideon alluded to this already uh, in, in, in terms of Xi Jinping, who has mm-hmm. clearly used the crisis and, and uh, after, I think, a, a, a extraordinary failure uh, right. in the beginning, both to inform people and to act uh, uh, quickly. Uh, used the fact that over time the crisis seems to have at least been abated earlier there than than anywhere else to sort of say the kind of way we are dealing with this is uh, is, is an example for others to follow. Should we worry about uh, not only strong men becoming stronger, but uh, that the, the the movement of strong men, that people are around the world are going to say, well, that's probably the right way for us to uh, to go about dealing with a crisis as large as this. Well, I think that that's that's certainly a concern, um, but I, but I th- I don't think people are going to forget the fact that Xi Jinping in the beginning did the wrong thing, you know he 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 and even now we don't know the whole story of what went out on in China. I mean he threw out reporters so that even uh, there's no way we can get really good information now. He has you know, he was very secretive to begin with. And I don't, even if he, if he ended up using his authoritarian powers to contain the virus, I don't think that leaves a good taste in people's mouth. I I really don't. Um, And uh, frankly, uh, you know, to go to back to Hungary, I mean, I'm very worried about uh, how Orban has, uh, you know, exponentially expanded his powers under under the guise of this crisis and very concerned that the EU has been unable unwilling to take any action against this country which was on a democratic path join the EU join NATO and now is completely completely maybe too extreme but is certainly on a path away from everything that those organizations stand for um, and just one more point I would make. So, so even if people would give Xi Jinping some credit for using his authoritarian powers to uh, address this issue, there are democracies that have done 
very good job at handling the problem. Germany, South Korea, uh, New Zealand. Uh, so uh, Taiwan. It's sorry. Taiwan. 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 Exactly. Yes. All right. And I mean that's that's actually the be the best counterpoint. Um, so I think we've got to instead of looking at the authoritarian regimes, we have to say, look, democracies did the right thing, and they also did it in public and with. The, um, you know, the support of their people. The thing about, about Xi's and Xi is that he, having, cons having consolidated so much power uh, and made himself basically the focus, the, cent the center of the Chinese government in a way no leader has been since Mao, he really can't escape responsibility for everything that's happened. And the thing about authoritarian autocratic regimes is they look very, very strong until something happens and, and cracks open up and you just never know what's going to be the one that's going to really make a difference. Uh, you know, on, on, on that point, a question is, is coming uh, through, uh, through social media to us uh, uh, on that issue. What should we do about this? The specific question is, is whether uh, the G20 ought to uh, do something to, uh, to, to hold uh, China to account uh, for the crisis because clearly if China had acted in a different way if more information had been shared earlier on about what was going on particularly about the human tr transmissibility of the disease uh, and earlier action had been taken we wouldn't be in the situation that we are now we would be in a bad situation but nothing uh, like the, uh, the the close to 3 million people now infected uh, and almost 200,000 killed, including, uh, I, I just noticed, 50,000 in the United States, uh, the, the level that we have just reached. Uh, is there something that we can take, Gideon, that the, that the G20 should do in order to, uh, to hold China to account? Well, I think the trouble is that all of the bodies you might mention, China is an important member of. I mean, it's a member of the G20. It's a member of the P5. Um, so... Um, quite how you would do that. I mean, I, I think that it's conceivable that you could, in a rather different political circumstances, uh, have an, an independent international investigation and committee of inquiry uh, that looked in a sober way at how this had started and so on. Mm -hmm. But even then, I think the Chinese would be highly reluctant to uh, allow people in. I mean, in comparison, actually, with how they dealt with SARS, they were relatively open because eventually they let, they let the WHO in um, and, um, and, and, and to visit Wuhan, but it's not clear how much real access the WHO got. This is a, a very secretive regime which uh, likes to control the message. And I think, you know, if she, in she's system, the system he's created is at fault, it's partly because um, it's so much built around the idea that she can do no wrong that uh, people are very, very reluctant to acknowledge anything going wrong that might reflect badly on the regime. I mean, I was in China, actually, just as this was all happening. I was in Shanghai in the middle of January, and there wasn't really much discussion of what was happening in Wuhan. But that we now know is because the people in Wuhan who were trying to raise the alarm were getting visits by the police, being told to sign retractions, and so on. Tragically, one of them Dr. Leng Wilang died uh, afterwards. Uh, so um, it's inherent to the regime. And I think that now they're in this propaganda struggle, power struggle with the United States, um, there's no way they're going to agree. And I think to be fair to them, uh, briefly, I, I think that they would also be justifiably concerned that if they, um, given given the tenor of the Trump administration and it's its uh, desire in the run-up to an election to label this the China virus, uh, mm -hmm. that they, would, um, they wouldn't necessarily be treated fairly by, by an international inquiry. I don't think that's uh, an absurd idea. Yeah, Carol, please. Uh, two more points. Don't you, do you think that China may pay a price, though, a, a psychic price, a, you know, the people being, um, people around the world being less willing to go to China, at least for a while, because of fears of the unknown, not knowing exactly how, whether the virus has been contained or not. And, and, and I would say, old-fashioned idea, but hopefully if there is a new president in the United States, 
um, it would seem to me really important to try to change the relationship with China because we can only address these transnational problems if we've got China and the United States, the two biggest economies working together. I mean, it's an, it's, to me, it's a natural way to cooperate. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that, um, look, put it this way, I, th I think that on their current trajectory, Chinese-US relations are in a very, very dangerous place because even before this happened, you had the trade war going on and both countries uh, have been heading in a more nationalistic direction. I mean, Trump with America first, but China very strongly. And from, uh, as I say, I haven't been back since January, we haven't been able to travel, but uh, from friends of mine there, China's, uh, the, the way the official media and social media are responding to this now is increasingly nationalistic. They've turned it round and said, look, the, uh, the West has failed to cope with this thing. We've coped with it. Now they're blaming us. It's all terribly unfair. The Chinese foreign ministry spokesman has even raised the possibility, highly irresponsibly, that this was introduced by the United States. Mm -hmm. So they're in a, in a kind of nationalist lather. And I think both sides at some point have to try to, to uh, you know, take, the, take the heat out of this. I think the, uh, the other element, and Steve, maybe you want to add that to, to your answer as well, is there's now a push to uh, reduce dependence on economic dependence, particularly in uh, medical equipment and other places uh, uh, on China and saying, listen, these supply chains aren't really working for us. And we, in the U.S. case, bring more, uh, reshore more at home. Uh, Japan has just issued a, a $2.2 billion uh, fund in order to allow people to relocate out of China. Uh, so that may be another uh, response. Steve? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. I think um, because of the dependence uh, the U.S. has on China for things like ventilators and masks and pharmaceutical production, um, I think you're going to see some action, uh, regardless of who's the next president, to sort of shore up a domestic supply of the, things like that for a future pandemic. And I, so I think China is going to pay a price in the trade realm for the way it's handled this, just because um, we, there, you know, there's no real trust in China's intentions and no real willingness to put our fortunes in the hands of the Chinese government the next time one of these pandemics comes along. Now, the question is whether the, you know, the U.S. will go about it in sort of a targeted, intelligent way or in sort of a, a broad, protectionist way that, that really is not that relevant to the, to the, to the, per, the particular problem we have. Steve, let me stay with you and, and, and move on to, uh, to another subject, Iran, uh, which uh, all of a sudden is back in the news. It, it was out of the news because of the COVID crisis. Remember, we started the year with uh, a, 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 almost a, a massive escalation and an almost a, a near war between the United States and Iran. Uh, Iran launched a military satellite the other day, which immediately led to uh, 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 statements by the United States. And the president then went to Twitter, his favorite uh, place to announce uh, new action, and said it's time to take down and, and shoot out of the water these boats that are harassing our naval ships. Uh, are we on the brink of a new escalation? Or are we trying to divert attention for what's happening? How can we look at what's happening in, in the Iran case uh, today? And, and where do you think this is heading? Well, I think the U.S. response is is more theater than anything. I think if we had wanted to escalate, uh, if we wanted, if we were willing to go to war with Iran, um, escalate into any significant hostilities, it would have happened back in January, after the Iranians responded to the to the uh, killing of General Soleimani by you know hitting some American bases in Iraq, um, and Trump made it very clear then that he was that he was eager not to not to go beyond that, and I think. Um, so when he and he threatens to you know shoot some small Iranian boats out of the water, hey, it's possible it'll happen. But I don't, I don't, I think the Iranians will probably back off a little bit, and I think the U.S. is not eager to pursue it. And it's not even clear that there, are, you know, that, that that the military has been giving any giving any new orders on on how to deal with these situations in Iran. You know the the uh, you know the missile the missile test the the, the satellite launch. I mean, it's taken as sort of a proxy for an ICBM test because they use basically the same technology. And obviously, we prefer not to have uh, the U.S. within reach of Iranian ICBMs. 
Um, of course, if you're concerned about the possibility of an Iranian nuclear attack on the U.S., then the, the, the sensible thing to do would be to you know, re-enter the JCPOA to you know, prevent Iran from taking steps toward acquiring nuclear weapons if they want to. Gideon, back in, in, in January when you saw these escalations, uh, the Europeans, uh, uh, the one thing despite Brexit and everything else that uh, uh, the UK and France and, and Germany in particular, which supported the EU, are, are, are united on is not only staying within the uh, Iran nuclear deal, but really finding ways to de-escalate uh, the crisis. Are, is there any worry that this is going to get out of hand, particularly since Iran seems to uh, have suffered extraordinarily from COVID-19 in ways that uh, they're not reporting in terms of deaths and, uh, and, and, and infections. And of course, the economic consequences of an oil crisis that we are, or oil price crisis that we're seeing. Um, any worry that, uh, that they see, uh, that is seen in Europe and anything they're trying to do about it? Well, the Europeans have been worried about Trump's policy to Iran from day one. Uh, they tried rather ineffectually to keep the JCPOA going, to find ways to continue to trade with Iran, but not really in a way that the Iranians ever found uh, kind of met their needs. Uh, they were very shocked by the killing of Soleimani and there was a spike in anxiety around then. But then I, since then, I, I think that, you know, other than the few specialists who deal with these and stuff in foreign ministries who are obviously still paying attention, it's not really uh, making the headlines in the UK in the same way or in France in the same way that is in the United States. I mean, I think that there's uh, so much focus on the health crisis that uh, people haven't noticed that, that uh, there's been a, an increase in tensions in Iran. That if anything, if there's the Middle East issue that people are paying attention to, I think it's more uh, the Saudi oil collapse and what's going on between Russia and Saudi Arabia, plus the threat of um, new flows of refugees out of Syria and Idlib and, and disease there. Carol, do you? Uh, how do you uh, see this uh, evolving situation? You, you know, theater. I, I mean, yeah, I agree that uh, it's theater. Certainly, it's um, you know, Trump is very good at trying to deflect and change the subject, and he's getting a lot of heat now on his handling of the pandemic. But I just think we cannot be sanguine about this. I mean, when you know, people who play, particularly mercurial leaders who play around with dangerous uh, relationships, uh, like the relationship between the United States and Iran, where we really have no direct contacts at the moment. Um, and so no, fail, no way to sort of uh, de-escalate something or really send messages in a, in a way that is trusted. I mean, we, we can go through the Swiss, but um, I, I just... I worry. I worry that the closer we get to the election and the more um, uh, political heat uh, is put on the president that, um, you know, I mean, I Iran, to some people, Iran seems like a really easy enemy. The United States has never gotten past 1979, the Islamic Revolution, and the administration and uh, the Republican Party has done a very good job of, you know, uh, ginning up uh, the image of Iran as the, you know, as the big enemy. And so I, I don't know what's going to happen. I, it makes me anxious. Uh, well, th talk about another anxious thing staying with you, Carol. Uh, just in the last few days, we are getting reports about the disappearance of Kim Jong-un. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the worry is that he's sick or worse, uh, either with coronavirus or some uh, 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 surgery that may have gone wrong. And if there is a country where having uh, a, a single leader in charge uh, being important in order to stabilize the situation, it's probably uh, North Korea. What, uh, what do you see in the reporting and what do you, what, how should, concerned should we be? So what happened was Daily NK, which is a Seoul-based website, reported on Monday that Kim was recovering from uh, some sort of cardiovascular surgery on April 12th. And it cited one unnamed source in North Korea. 
uh, the state-controlled media in North Korea has been silent about Kim's whereabouts. Uh, on Wednesday, the second highest U.S. general said he had no intelligence to confirm or deny that Kim was seriously ill. And on Thursday, Trump at the White House said he thinks the reports of Kim's health problems are incorrect. But really, who knows? North Korea is the most secretive country on earth, and the United States has long struggled to understand what's going on there, often learning about the details after the fact. So the usual source of intelligence for the United States are satellites, South Korean intelligence, which makes a point of cultivating North Korean defectors and anyone else who goes to North Korea, and China, which is the North's main ally and supplier of food and fuel. Except US-China ties today are, as we talked about, in such bad shape, it's unclear how well that channel may be working for us these days. Also, you know, arguably, it's not in the U.S. interest to publicly corroborate an event which, if true, would be a political earthquake in North Korea. So um, I, I'd be shocked if the United States was the one that confirmed some, you know, horrible thing. Um, nevertheless, you know, we can't just dismiss the rumors. Uh, Kim has a, Kim Jong-un has a weight problem. He's missed some recent events, public events that he would normally be expected to attend. Most notably, the April 15th commemoration of his, um, his grandfather's 108th birthday. Um, and some analysts say they sense that a power play could be in the works. Uh, when Kim's sister, Kim Yo Jong, was elevated recently to be an alternate member of the Politburo. So what could be the scenarios for that? Maybe he did have a medical procedure and is in recovery. Maybe he has COVID-19. Maybe he's dead. Maybe there's been a coup d'etat. Or maybe there's some sort of, you know, game playing going on. Um, you know, the pandemic is a big problem for North Korea. Um, they, almost before anyone else, on, in, in early January, when the WHO declared that it was the pan, you know, COVID was a public health crisis, they canceled international travel, they closed the borders, they placed foreign visitors under some sort of quarantine and declared a national emergency. So, um, I mean, this, we talked about Afghanistan not having a health system able to cope with this. North Korea is even worse, frankly. And uh, they, they suffer from the same thing as, as many countries, including our own, which is a lack of testing. So you don't, you don't even know what the scope of the problem is. The government claims they have no COVID cases. Nobody believes that because they have a border with South Korea and with China, both, of, both countries have big COVID problems. So, um, you know, and on top of that, the North Koreans are chronically malnourished, and, and there are great concerns that now that the border's closed, you know, North Korea is not going to be able to get the food that it needs to feed its people from China, um, and that the seeds and other equipment that's necessary to plant, um, you know, plant for the season, that's not going to go forward or at some, you know, curtailed um, level. So it's, um, you know, it's really watch and see. Uh, if Kim were to disappear, um, you know, as I indicated, her, his sister is uh, considered the most likely one to take over. She has uh, had a bigger and bigger public role in recent years. She was at his meeting with, with Trump. Um, and so, you know, I mean, the U.S. military does analyses all the time about what would happen if South Korea, I mean, North Korea imploded. Uh, so they've done planning. Whether the country would just, you know, there'd be some sort of political cataclysm if he, if he was gone, um, not, not so clear, not so clear. Steve, in a minute or so, we, we, we have left. Uh, I mean, part of the issue that 
is, of course, the close society, a very big part uh, that we face. We've also, uh, all contact with North Korea has now been cut off because the North Koreans have made clear they only want to deal with President Trump. Uh, and and they've, they've said they don't even want to deal with the Secretary of State anymore. Is that a problem in trying to find things out that's happening there? <laughs> I mean, I think everything about the way uh, the President has dealt with North Korea is a problem. Um, he's very unpredictable. He has this personal relationship with Kim. Um, it doesn't seem to uh, align with his own Secretary of State's uh, attitude and policies. Um, it's very hard to to know what, if anything, the president thinks he can accomplish or how he's going to accomplish it. And of course, you have with, with, with Secretary of State Pompeo, you have somebody who's you know been openly in favor of regime change in North Korea. And it's not surprising that the North Koreans would not be eager to deal with somebody like that. I mean, you have, I mean I, in a sense, the administration is covering both, both bases, you know, the good cop and the bad cop, and it's not clear that either one is working very well. Well, North Korea, like Iran and so many other places around the world, are hard, hard questions uh, and hard issues to resolve. Uh, but I greatly appreciate uh, Steve Chapman, Gideon Rockman, uh, Carol Giacomo for joining us this week for World Review. We'll be back next week, and uh, this, uh, uh, this will be online shortly. Again, thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Wonderful to have you here today. Thanks, Eva. Ciao. Take care.